of this discussion that we're hearing is based on a premise, which I'm not sure is accurate at all about schools getting rich off of these kids or athletics and the huge profits that uh, they're making when there is a difference between revenue and profit. So you, you, you mentioned earlier and, and you cite in a couple of places in the book that roughly 20 or 22 of the FBS schools are even making a profit in their football program alone. Now, I'm not an accountant. <laughs> I, I don't play one on TV and I, I don't even play one on the Internet. Uh, I have seen some fairly impressive reportage out there that these schools are kind of cooking the books uh, on, on that figure. How, how much can we trust uh, that number, 20 to 22 FBS schools uh, in the black or at least breaking even? And how would you assess the impression of the financials of college football with the reality of those financials? You know, it's, it's interesting. I don't think um, even if you, a few of them are cooking the books, um, if you have 120, and I think we're on our way to 130 now, which is another interesting thing. You have, I think this year alone and next year, you're going to have 17 schools add football programs. And you're like, you have no chance in the, in the world of making money. So why are they doing this? They're doing it because of one reason. Football has become the single most effective way to market a school and to market a brand. Uh, one of the chapters, Towson University running a, you know, a huge deficit in its football program, um, goes down to LSU to essentially take a beating, plays a phenomenal game. But it's really about building the brand. It's not so much about what the football team is doing. The game is almost secondary to the fact that they're on national TV and it's an opportunity to get Towson University, not Townsend or Towson State, you know, get that Towson University out into the public eye. And I don't know whether they're cooking the books, but it is, as you referenced, Dave Brandon is the athletic director at Michigan said it's, it's like the worst business model in the history of business models. You know, you're pouring all this money in and virtually 80 to 90% of them are losing money, but they continue to do it because the rewards, if you, you know, lightning strikes and you turn a program around like Johnny Manziel did at A&M, um, or I think what's going to happen here fairly soon at UCLA with Jim Mora, uh, the, the back end windfall is tremendous, not only um, with bowl game revenue and excuse me, and a potential national playoff spot, but the donations and the admissions to the school skyrocket. And, um, you know, the Saban effect at Alabama is absolutely exhibit A of that. Let's talk about recruiting. Now, I, I promise this is not staged and this was this is not this is not trick photography, but I actually reached into this bookshelf behind me and I pulled out. I don't have the jacket. This is the original hardcover of Raw Recruits. So for our viewers and listeners, you wrote this with Alex Wolf. I remember. I, I, I don't want to date either one of us. I remember reading the excerpts of Raw Recruits in the National, if anybody even remembers the National, uh, yeah. and what a groundbreaking book that was about the recruiting in college basketball. Again. I don't know if anybody got fired or put on probation, but it was just peeling back the curtain. So it's oh, fair to say, there you go. So we sell a few copies of that as well. But so it, it's fair to say, Armin, that it would take a lot to shock you uh, when it comes to recruiting. Uh, you spent some time with uh, a wide receiver from Texas by the name of Ricky Seals Jones. He's now at Texas A&M, but uh, that family gave you great access to his whole recruitment you have his dad talking about getting offered $300,000, which I think is starting to sound like real money, uh, which he says they turned down, never named the school. Uh, and, and, and an incredible scene uh, of the pressure that the Texas coaching staff was trying to put on this young man, basically saying, commit to us right now or we're going to stop recruiting you. He did not commit, and they, in fact, did uh, stop recruiting him. So in, in all the coverage uh, and reportage that you did in the world of college football recruiting, Armin, what shocked you the most? Well, this was uh, right up there because one of my goals, and Jeff had his set of goals and I had my set of goals, one of my goals was to get what could be charitably called the going rate right now for a five-star, four-star recruit. I was you know, infinitely aware of the $180,000 number that had been um, reported about uh, what Cam Newton's father had allegedly um, requested from Mississippi State for his son to go there. Certainly there was a big NCA investigation and, and, and nobody was eventually charged in it, but clearly that number was out there. 
And that was about five years ago. And that's when these athletic departments were generating maybe to 60 to 70 million. Now you had 80, 90, $100 million revenues in these departments. And so had, had the, the going rate gone up, you know, commensurate with the revenues. And the fact is um, the Ricky Seals Jones chapter is fascinating in a number of ways. One of which you alluded to Seth is the, is the real bitter battle between Texas and A&M and LSU and some of the other schools involved. But it's also a wonderful story about a family, um, a, a husband and a wife, you know, two parents, Ricky Seals is the, is, the, is the cousin, the first cousin of Eric Dickerson. He's six foot five, 225 pounds. He's a phenomenal athlete, an honor student, a great kid. So he's the perfect recruit. So what's he worth? The number one athlete in the state of Texas. Well, as it turned out, as you said, I knew for a fact that Chester Jones had been offered $300,000, the use of a luxury suite, eight season tickets, $1,000 a month to Ricky, $500 a month to the family. That was the offer on the table. And then when I sat down with Chester Jones, when he originally denied it, he went on to say that there were schools willing to double that number, six and 700,000. And those were the numbers that he used. I didn't put those numbers in his mouth. He said that. So that gives you an idea of just how valuable um, a game-changing athlete is to these schools right now. Because first of all, it's money off the books. No one's ever going to see it. It's going to be cash, and it's certainly going to move silently. And second of all, an athlete like Ricky Seals Jones is the difference between a 10 and two season and a 12 and 0 season. It's a, he's a BCS bowl bid and he's a spot in the national championship or a semi game. So those kind of athletes to these programs now are worth the risk versus the reward. And that's what Mark Emmert was trying to remove with the investigative staff sort of takes us into the Miami case, but, but the investigative staff was trying to send a huge message. So when these coaches were making this kind of risk versus reward calculus, they would say, I can't risk it. But now, given the state of the investigative staff and the enforcement staff in Indianapolis, um, and I say this in the book, if you were looking for the best time to cheat in college football, you're in it right now.